A very good morning to all of you and thank you for joining us today for the Business Times webinar on startup investments in the digital economy. Indonesia is Southeast Asia's largest economy and home to the world's fourth largest population. The country has charted impressive growth since overcoming the Asian financial crisis in the 1990s and its next phase of development lies in the digital arena. A report by Google, Tomasek and Bain, estimated that Indonesia's internet economy will nearly triple from USD 44 billion in 2020 to USD 124 billion in 2025. Now, against this backdrop, what growth trends should startup investors look out for? What does it take for startup founders to raise funds successfully? And at the same time, major industrial and agricultural sectors that contributed to the economic growth of Indonesia is also experiencing disruption. What kind of role do they have to play in the digital world? We'll be addressing these questions in today's webinar, brought to you by Garage, an award-winning content vertical by The Business Times. Garage covers startup news and issues in Singapore and Southeast Asia. We focus on the startup ecosystem through an investor's lens, and it marries BT's brand of hard-nosed journalism with sharp analysis of startup business models. Garage has covered topics including the gig worker economy, the rise and fall of tech companies, and what happens behind the scenes of venture capital. I'm Claudia, a journalist in the Garage team. And before we dive into the panel discussion today, let me introduce our panelists. So we have here with me in the studio, Wilson Chuacha, managing partner at East Ventures. And then here with me, Jeffrey Sia, partner at Quest Ventures. And then dialing in from Indonesia, we have John Riadi, Chairman of Siloam Hospitals and Managing Partner at Ventura Capital, and Jonathan Sudata, CEO and co-founder of HaloDoc. Thanks all of you for being here with us today. So can I get all of you to just you know, very briefly tell us about your background in Indonesia's tech scene and um, you know, perhaps also one thing that people don't really know about, one interesting thing. Um, Wilson, let's start with you. Oh, hi. Thanks, Claudia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we started 12 years ago uh, from year 2009, and until today, we have invested over 200 uh, companies. Uh, in the beginning, of, we are one of the oldest firms, actually, in Indonesia, probably in Southeast Asia as well. Uh, when we started investing in Indonesia, there were only about 30 million internet population, about 13% penetration of 230 million population. As of today, we have about 200 million internet users, so the internet penetration rate is about 74%. Yeah. What's interesting is, um, with over 200 portfolio, actually I work round the clock, 24 hours, like 7-Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, let's come to you. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you, Claudia, for having us here. Uh, I must say that you are employee number one for garage and you never tell us about that. Uh, I am an accidental venture capitalist. I think I spent 25 years in the corporate world, the original disruption place, the advertising marketing world, where big data and um, I remember partnering Alibaba, Tencent, Google, Facebook when they were like 5% strong mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And in understanding those, uh, in working those markets, every of my multinational clients wanted to see Indonesia. Mm. As Indonesia was the biggest market and it represented the coming of Southeast Asia. Mm. I remember bringing, uh, at the time there was this pop group in Korea called um, um, Super Junior, right? Now I think they are quite old, they are all super senior. So I think when they launched the <laughs> Galaxy, Samsung Galaxy phone, we went down to Indonesia. In those days, uh, Indonesia you know, getting, trying to sell Samsung phones was tough, and this was 2013, 2014, right? Mm. 2012, 2013, 2014. Today, I think based on the research of one of our invested Indonesian company, a market intelligence firm, Populix, mm. I think today there's about 199 million mobile phones in Indonesia, mm. right? And I think the numbers keep changing, depending how whether there's grey market imports <laughs> from uh, Bukalapa. I, and I think this market uh, continuously attracts the attention of big corporates all over the world. And I think digital has now driven its economic growth. In fact, I would, I would harbour the thought that development economics in Indonesia is solely driven by the digital economy. Mm. Interesting insights. Mm. John, we're coming to you now. 
Um, can you tell us more about your experience in the internet economy? Uh, well, first of all, Claudia, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I think uh, the, the, the topic uh, that uh, you guys have chosen for today's discussion is uh, extremely uh, timely. Uh, you know, we uh, have been investing in the Southeast Asian technology space since 2014. And believe it or not, in 2014, the entire technology space in Indonesia was about 60 million US dollars. Uh, that same space today is around $60 billion. So this is a space that has grown a thousand times uh, over the last seven years. So it's, a, it's an extremely dynamic and fast growing space. And I think interestingly, um, we're, we're, we're just getting started. Um, so I think over the next couple of years, this should be a three, four, five hundred billion dollar industry. Um, and you know, for this reason, um, this uh, technology and digital space in Indonesia has become a core part um, of what our group does. Uh, I think beyond uh, the value creation opportunities, uh, what I find uh, most exciting um, is also working with uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, so many uh, gifted and talented entrepreneurs uh, changing. Um, the landscape, the business landscape here in Indonesia. And I also believe that uh, the digital world and the digital ecosystem is the solution um, to Indonesia's post-COVID uh, economic recovery. So exciting stuff, and I look forward to our discussion today. Thanks. Jonathan, um, thanks for joining us today. Can you tell us a bit more about your experience and also what you do? Thank you, Claudia, and thank you for everyone for having me here. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sudarta. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder for Halado. Um, we are a, a digital healthcare platform that try to simplify access for healthcare for um, from connecting patients to 20,000 doctors to getting medicine sent to your hand within 31 minutes in average um, from the closest pharmacy because we're connected to over 4,000 pharmacy and also providing tests such as um, like the, the, the current one would be COVID tests, but we also do provide blood tests at your home or at the convenience of drive through and also connecting uh, patients um, with the loop of, of hospitals. So we are an online to opt um, for healthcare um, access in Indonesia. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very interesting time where, where today I think Indonesia um, have gone through a, a period of COVID just like any other countries in the world. And, and, and I think a very interesting part about Indonesia is the government um, is very open in, in working together with startup, founder, startup companies, uh, digital healthcare companies like us, among others, to, is to help um, solving the COVID problem. Just so for, for everyone, we are working together with them by providing consultation for patients, and the medicine is actually giving, uh, are given free by the government. I don't think there is anybody, there is anyone in the world or any government in the world that actually uh, do such uh, movement to 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 ease the pain of of COVID by using the the digital platform and actually solving one of the healthcare issue yeah, by the sending sure. medicine directly from the government. For sure. Thank you. Yeah. Now that we know more about each of our speakers here, um, you know, let's dive straight into the discussion. Wilson, I want to come back to you. So, you know, tell us more about why this is an opportune time to invest in Indonesia's digital economy and what are the specific growth trends that you're eyeing, taking a very close look at? So, I would like to draw the contrast in, okay. in the past that we only have, let's say, 30 million internet users. And as of today, we have 200 million internet users. What does it mean actually translating into day-to-day -day activities? Uh, for, the, uh, for the startups or for the company, this means you have huge amount number of users that start spending digitally uh, through e-money, uh, through uh, online transaction, etc. And we are talking about 200 million uh, population that are working on it. And then uh, in the other side, over the past 12 years, we have uh, invested a lot of company. I think uh, last count probably from our uh, firm, we bring in about 5 billion US dollars to Indonesia. And this actually translates into what we call building a digital infrastructure. So while you're having digital infrastructure from online payment, online delivery, and et cetera, and you have a huge number of uh, internet population that spend uh, uh, spend transaction digitally, we are in the inflection point. 
So in the past, if you launch a company in Indonesia, to get 30,000 downloads of mobile uh, app, it took probably six months. As of today, you launch a new app, in one month, you get one million, two million, easily. So we, I think that we are in the inflection point right now. So uh, the trend, I think, is very clear. It started with e-commerce. That's our hypothesis as a locomotive. As the e-commerce uh, move forward, uh, e-commerce enabler come in, online advertisement come in, and then one by one, it educate the users, healthcare, digital healthcare come in, um, logistic will come, one by one, yeah. So actually, as of now, everybody actually moved towards uh, digital transformation. You spoke about e-commerce, and it's true that we've seen that a lot of the mature companies and unicorns now are in the B2C space. But, you know, having seen the evolution of e-commerce, what stage are we at right now? I think we are still in the early stage because the e-commerce that we know uh, right now is still, uh, we, we started with marketplace and then moved into vertical commerce. Then we talk about e-commerce enabler that support marketplace and vertical commerce. Uh, it it, it moved into, a, as, as the user behavior change, actually the way the e-commerce works changed as well. Uh, recently we noticed that you see a lot of uh, live commerce. So those live streaming that people can immediately make a purchase. Um, uh, and recently, we, we do see the rise of instant commerce, for example. So there's a lot of this compress of uh, uh, delivery or supply chains going on, and people can transact, transact online. It always follows the users. So as the user behavior change, the way you outreach the user and how you close the deal, let the user transact actually change. Jeffrey, what kind of trends are you seeing in Indonesia's startup economy? You know, Indonesia is an uh, amazing space. Um, some, while its size is three to 400 million people, per what, uh, we, per what the different estimates are, but it's actually a great petri dish for when it comes to uh, the, for, on the commerce front. I think uh, Wilson alluded earlier to the fast-moving changes people have. I think if I look at the, the marketplace itself, when we compare, when we were doing a lot of digital marketing and advertising in the early years, the trend was always how fast the Americans were in driving trends. But today, I think as the commerce facilities and the ecosystems surround it, a lot of uh, what we used to call impulse purchase, now it becomes instant purchase, all right? You know, we used to think that uh, there's consideration and there is a cooling off periods. But these things are no more concepts anymore because people make instant decisions. So we see the Indonesian market uh, as we look at it, I think the, it would probably drive a lot of consumer behavior models going forward. Right? I think the, org the organic development of ecosystems earlier to John's point, it also tells you that there potentially will be models written about Indonesia that will probably lead the rest of the world right? while compared versus what used to be past when America was leading the world. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, I want to come to you. Um, you know, you don't come from an investments background. You actually have a founder's perspective. What is it? right now that excites you, um, you know, and actually is driving the growth of the digital economy? Yeah, I think um, there is a saying, right, in, in, the, in the digital space that um, we, only, we can only grow when there is a problem for us to solve. Um, and country like Indonesia, I think we have um, default uh, challenges because of the, 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 the country demogra uh, demography uh, and geographical situation, right? We have 270 million population with 17,000 island, um, 74,000 villages. Um, you can imagine um, it's a very multicultural country. So because of that, uh, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of challenge actually comes. That's why a lot of um, opportunity and space actually comes uh, within the process. Now, specifically for me, um, I'm in the healthcare space because the, the default challenge create this kind of healthcare access challenge. We only have three doctors out of 10,000 population. Um, John would know better than me with, with regards to his investment in, in the Siloam Hospital. Um, we only have, I think, a thousand um, cardiologists for the whole country of Indonesia. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, John. But if you think about it, a thousand cardiologists mean each of these cardiologists have to take care of 260 or 270,000 patients. Um, I think only technology can help the, the, the healthcare access 
to create um, um, to democratize healthcare access for Indonesia. Uh, if you think if you think about it, right? So I think um, this is definitely um, an area where opportunity exists. But the one thing that I think is also very much exciting is the way our government actually look at digital players. Um, they are actually very progressive, very positive thinking from the president to the minister to, you know, to everyone. So they actually embrace the digital player as part of the solution for the country. Um, and I, I mentioned um, through an example uh, from the support and also the use case that they use um, for for solving problems or for solving problems like um, education and and whatnot. So I think um, I think it is a very interesting country where we have default challenge, but we have support from the government, a lot of interest from uh, um, financial supporter like all the panelists today, um, and I think there is. A lot of talents, young talents, who are who are bravely trying to embrace and explore all of these opportunities. There is a young population um, that's excited and raring to go. Uh, your company, Halo Dog, was very involved in the COVID response, and you know, can you tell us more about what the collaboration with the government was like? And you know, did you experience any um, hiccups? Like, you know, there is this perception that you know the government could be slow. There's a lot of red tape. Was that the same that you experienced? No. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have to say, our government, um, in in some respect, especially the Ministry of Health, there they work like startup. Um, I have meetings with them almost every day, like from 7 p.m finish maybe at 11 p.m. and then start another meeting the next day at 10 p.m., finish at 12 p.m. at night. Um, why do we have so many meetings? Because we do continuous iteration, um, which is, you know, it's very normal if I do that kind of meetings with startup founders, but this is, we're having a meeting with the government here. Um, and why they are, why are they having this continuous uh, iteration? Because they're focusing on solving the problem not falling in love with a particular solution because we have a mantra right in, in, in Hello Doc particularly don't fall in love with a solution fall in love with the right problem now that is exactly how the government actually looking at this so the word that the government uh, is actually down I think it's the other way around they are actually helping us to expedite solution for Indonesia so I think it's it's very unique uh, the way they approach it um, and yeah, I think I, I have an extremely great experience in, in, in looking at the way government actually react to, on, on this kind of situation. It's definitely refreshing. And I'm talking about multiple minister, multiple ministry, yeah? not just health wow. minister, but it's like <laughs> the Ministry of uh, um, Maritime uh, and Investment and, and, and a few other ministers as well. So I think it's, wow. it's across the whole country. Cross ministries, huh? Um, John, coming to you now, so, you know, you've made some prominent startup investments and, uh, you know, one of it is Ovo, which, as we all know, is a unicorn now. So, as someone who's viewing the landscape from a corporate lens, what, what's your perspective on, you know, um, unlocking the value of tech investments? Uh, thank you, Claudia. Look, I think um, uh, we're at a critical inflection point. Um, for technology in Indonesia. You know, Wilson earlier um, mentioned about the different uh, parts of the ecosystem uh, that have really uh, become more and more mature. Um, I think in Indonesia, uh, we're clearly seeing um, the coming together uh, of consumer behavior, uh, which is accelerated um, by uh, the conditions brought forth by COVID. Um, so, you know, this, I think, is, is an extremely important uh, development uh, amidst the uh, technology sort of ecosystem. I think on top of that, I think we're seeing an um, incredible uh, also shift in terms of uh, capital and capital flows. And, you know, as we see a number of companies, you know, going public or about to go public, this will allow the Indonesian ecosystem to access um, a whole new uh, pool of capital a much larger pool of capital uh, than what was available before. 
So uh, I, I think we're, you know, for all these reasons, you know, the ecosystem is really um, at, a, at a, about to enter an inflection point. I think from an our perspective, you know, we've always taken a, um, a multi-pronged approach to digital. On the one hand, since 2014, uh, we have continued to invest in uh, various uh, startups, uh, and that's given us an incredible uh, front row seat uh, in not only being able to support, but, in, but more importantly, to be able to learn from uh, the various companies found and founders that we work with. But I think interestingly, what we're seeing more and more today is that not only are there interesting investment opportunities, but we're also seeing inter interesting partnership opp opportunities with these startups. So as you know, uh, one of the largest um, you know, tech uh, companies in Indonesia, for example, recently took a stake in our supermarket business. So this is an example of you know, a, a technology company and sort of an offline company coming together, uh, each bringing its own resources to be able to create a true omni-channel experience in a way that each of us alone um, you know, couldn't do. Um, so I think, uh, you know, in, in Indonesia, we're coming to realize that there are unique models uh, for the Indonesian market that brings together sort of both online and offline players. So in that regard, you know, um, you know I'm, I'm excited as we look at our various businesses. Um, there are uh, so many opportunities to grow and also learn from and work with uh, the various digital players. You know, I've been extremely inspired by what Jonathan has done, um, you know, during the whole uh, COVID uh, pandemic and supporting the government. You know, we've done our part, but I also see what Jonathan has done um, incredible. Um, and I think uh, the healthcare space is huge. Um, so, you know, uh, I think as you go through sector by sector, um, you know, we see that there are uh, so many opportunities uh, for the tr uh, traditional companies to work with and grow and learn from um, some of the digital players around. So, so very, very exciting uh, time uh, in Indonesia. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, you know, you've been credited with helping to steer Lippo Group into the digital age, you know, in areas such as e-commerce, e-payments, tech investments. Um, and I know that there are a lot of us here today in the audience who are anxious about their place in the digital economy because they come from traditional sectors. What kind of advice do you have for them? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm here to be giving out advice, but you know, there's a Chinese saying that, 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 that goes, uh, when, when the winds of change begin to blow, some people build windmills while others build walls. So look, I think you know, we live in a world today where the winds of change have begun to blow. Uh, I think uh, we're uh, about to witness um, one of the biggest uh, uh, transformations um, not only generationally, but I think in humankind. And so this presents huge opportunities. Um, today in Indonesia, we are a consumer services group that serve about 40 million people every year, uh, 40 million unique individuals every year in Indonesia. Uh, and yet I think as we enter this digital uh, uh, era, um, you know, we have to change, we've got to transform, we've got to learn. And if we do that, I think there's so much more we can do. Um, and so, you know, we are just open-minded, you know, in some cases, you know, we've worked with um, uh, companies uh, and startups to invest and just learn. In other situations like OVO, these are companies that we started and along the way um, entered into partnerships with other companies. Um, and we've done that because we think that's what's best for the company and the companies such as OVO that you mentioned um, is successful today because we took that approach. Um, and uh, across all of our companies, we've taken an uh, open ecosystem approach. So even in OVO, for example, OVO very, very early on uh, worked with and accepted payments um, with you know, all of our so-called competitors, right? So um, I think this is the, the world uh, we live in today. Um, and uh, hopefully over the next decade, uh, we can uh, uh, be you know, building uh, windmills um, and working with other people to, to do the same. For sure. Jeffrey, I want to um, turn to you now because you spent many years in the corporate world and you also did some angel investing before you became partner at Quest Ventures. What's your perspective on uh, you know, how startups can work with corporates or, and also how corporates can try to transform themselves? Uh, thanks for the question. I think that question has been asked many times even in the business school, right? Uh, often they're not uh, a when I when the, when the corporates do take the first step in most of them I think uh, adopt a mindset where aim broken don't fix it 
So usually when they make that first step is when they see some storms at the horizon. Or to uh, John's point, maybe the winds are blowing very strong and they don't have the wall to block it. Some folks uh, will go forward and find new capabilities, but others uh, will just wait and see for the one that is mainstream. I think for our space itself, uh, when we looked at, uh, for my personal experience, it wasn't easy trying to convince people to disrupt because uh, confirmation bias mindsets often pervade the corporate world where you, once you get a certain standard operating procedure the way you make decisions, you tend not to look outside and what you don't know don't really exist. That's always been the mindset. So for those brave folks that try to look forward, they have not just uh, partake with uh, giving projects to startups and in our world we call it POC, a proof of concept project. But at the same time, many of them, I think, uh, as they work towards it, they also become angel investors with me. And I think I, I, that was also uh, the kicker for me, the teaser for me, to see that there is actually a big link between the startup world and the corporate world. And then uh, it wasn't always driven by the family owner. But I do feel that uh, many times the, the professional workers or the middle management, uh, we don't give enough credit to them. Some of them take the risk and wanted to do it to self-transform before it happens. But that has always been a track. For, for Southeast Asia, Indonesia has always been the place to try that out because it was a big enough market, there was enough potential and the hope was always there. So I think that that uh, genesis today, that, that journey today becomes a lot more shorter and tighter and we see a lot more cooperation, much, much closer between the corporates and the startup world. And this is very good for the region. Mm. Do you have any examples of how you know, this could work out well, uh, the relationship? Well, I, I think this, uh, again, a very excellent question, Claudia. Uh, I think uh, I, we used to have a joke in the advertising world when we, uh, we in, I remember when I introduced a client, a new service called Google in 2003. And a client, a customer told me, you know, a big multinational client said, Jeff, we're a big company. Uh, we don't know what we Google. They are they are probably a fly by night company. will close tomorrow, you know. So, uh, but then gen the gentleman, to his credit, his son today is now working in Google. And the gentleman who told me that, and he was a big multinational CEO, CMO of a, of an American brand. Uh, I I think uh, it wasn't easy. So often I in my in the early days of digital transformation, right, in uh, maybe 2015 to 16, 17. Uh, I will always get clients to create a panic room. I will tell them, you know, you create a panic room. Uh, today we call it a CVC or accelerator, where you allow the startups to go and work with them, try them out, and um, if they're uncomfortable, they can go back to their shells. Uh, the corporates can go back, their shells can go back. I think that actually was a natural evolution towards corporates working with startups. And it also explains uh, for my Quest Ventures Fund and many corporates uh, who wanted to do digital transformation partake in it and also join the accelerator programs. Mm -hmm. uh, Wilson, I'd like to turn to you now for some perspective because you've been investing in um, startups in Indonesia for over a decade now. So, you know, now that Indonesia is emerging on the global stage and, um, you know, like John mentioned, the capital flows are changing. We're also seeing more international money coming in from the US, from China. How does this impact the local VC scene? Uh, I think it's impact positively to everyone. I mean, more money means that you can develop the product faster, you can develop the market faster, you can educate more users. Um, it's clear distinction between local VC and international VC. I mean, in the nascent ecosystem like Indonesia, it's like a jungle in the beginning. Who is the best guy to navigate the jungle? The local kampung boy that live nearby. Because in the emerging ecosystem, you need to some, a lot of times you have to use your intuition. And as it goes, you build a path. And now everybody come use the road using the path. That, that's fine. Everybody can enjoy the scenery in the jungle. So that, that is how we look at that. We welcome all the investment from abroad because they not only bring money, they bring knowledge. So it's a value add to ecosystem. With this, we can educate more talent. There's a talent war going on. But with more money, we can train more people. We can recruit more people. Uh, we can build a uh, more you know, innovative product. And definitely in Indonesia, it's a land of inefficiency. You look at Indonesia, it seems like in the, in the past 10 years, there's so many problems. But you have two perspectives. You look at it as a problem or you look at it as opportunity. So for this, that's why for us, we are sector agnostic. We, we invest anything that make, makes money, of course, but using technology. Because if we able to spot the problem and make things 10 times cheaper or 10 times faster, 
we will invest if they use technology to enhance that. Yeah. Yeah. On the topic of these um, you know, foreign investors coming in, and as you rightly mentioned, more capital means uh, also more opportunities, more spending, of course more cash burning. Um, uh, you not know, necessary. But not necessary. Yeah. Okay. But we, we can dive into that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah let's Go talk ahead. about yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, where on the street is that these investors, you know, having invested globally, they tend to do things like drive up valuations or even, um, you know, write checks much faster, um, give a firmer answer to startups. Has there been any sense that the local VCs might get itched out of the oh, important no, deals? No. no, we are in the information age. Yeah, so, for ex example, for, in the, uh, for East Ventures, we have over uh, 200 portfolio. What, what does it mean? It means we have almost 500 founders or C-level founding member in our networks. Mm -hmm. We have a compounding of uh, information going on within our network and that creates a uh, network effect. We talk about the historical data point. We have the data point of 12 years experience what's going on in Indonesia. You, you can't take that away. So I think there's still valuable this is what we call a local wisdom. Yeah, so it is not as simple as someone come with the money and then you can just, uh, you can just uh, compete with a local startup. This has been proven. Okay. For example, like Tokopedia. After Tokopedia, we invested three months. Another foreign player come in, put in millions of dollars. We fight with them. Few, next few years, another guy come in, we fight with them. Next few years, another, time, another guy come, we fight again. It's like David for versus Goliath forever, but it's okay. Yeah, and now they, they join force with uh, Gojek, form a go to one of the largest, single largest probably uh, technology platform in Southeast Asia. It's going to be interesting. And we still see that they in, you know, it, it, uh, keep doing the innovation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, looking forward to those yeah. battles. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, you have investors on your cap table that span different countries, different investor types. You know, we're talking about conglomerates, state investor, um, VCs, etc. Can you share more about your fundraising strategy and also how you actually manage all these different interests? Yeah, so I think, I think um, let me start with the second question first. I think um, we, we have an interest in the company, um, which is to simplify healthcare. Um, the investors that is investing in Halodop, I think, comes in three groups. The first group would be the financial groups, um, like the UOB Ventures, um, the Masek, um, Open Space Ventures. Um, that, that is the first group of um, investors. The second group would be what, what we call more the strategic partner, um, like um, Gojek, well, Gojek can be part of Go Ventures and also um, the, 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 the arm of the business itself. Um, we have Bleebly. Um, we have also um, companies like uh, insurance company, like Allianz Prudential, and also um, the one that is very much uh, focused on impact, like Gates and Melinda Foundation. Um, also, uh, UOB Ventures have this, this specific mandate on, on one of their cap area. They have all different interests, but they are all bound by one uh, goal to have impact to humanity. So I think that makes my life a bit simpler in that regards. So coming back to your first question about the strategy, I think of, of fundraising, I think it's, it's uh, from my side, it's quite simple. We have a mission that we're trying to achieve. So we are very purpose driven on simplifying access to healthcare. We go, um, uh, and, and try to be part, friends and partner with investors that also already have that kind of calling. So we're not trying to pitch to them, but we're trying to align the mission. If there is an alignment of mission, then it's very easy for us to collaborate together um, with regards to uh, you know, um, financial discussion, investments, um, short term and long term. So I think that's, that's how, that's how we, we align the interests and that's how I, my strategy of, of finding investors um, that is connected to Halodoc today and going forward as well. You know, a founder once asked me, um, 
what is one thing that I definitely should not do when I'm pitching to an investor? Do you have an answer to that? One thing that I should not do pitching to an investor? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I, think, I think one thing that we should not um, pitching to investors is pitching overly on solution. But I think we should focus and telling uh, investors on what problems are you trying to solve. And then talks about what is the solution? Because if you are so much in love with a solution, that solution might not be a particular problem. Um, so I think, I think um, I come back to that mantra, um, that one philosophy. So I think we should not tell too much about our solution, more about what are the problems that we're trying to, to solve. Mm. Yeah, I think one thing that you have to say to your investor and how you communicate to your investor is being yourself. You have to be authentic. You don't, you don't try to look smart and uh, explain some data that you don't understand. Yeah. I think that's very key. Being authentic, be yourself. Yeah. Because not everyone could become entrepreneur. Yeah. yeah. So being yourself, be, be yourself. Yeah. And having been in the business for so long, you can immediately tell when someone is <laughs> trying to fake it. Oh yeah, that's our speciality, <laughs> especially in, in uh, early stage uh, investment. Huh, John, we, we quite invest a lot. So when, when in, the, in the early stage investment, we, when someone pitch to you, most of the time the team probably only have idea. Mm. Two young gentlemen or uh, a group of uh, women come and then pitch. How are you going to use uh, business judgment to judge them? You can't, there's no data, there's nothing. You can only look at their eyes and make sure that they don't take your money and run away. So that's, that's the reality of seed uh, investment. Sometimes I think they are, to the point of authentic, we also see a sense of vulnerability in them. I think the, the many of the, I mean, to, to Wilson's point, I think those who are bestowed with a mission to be entrepreneur, often they show their, what they want to achieve. And they also let you, you also can see what they know they are struggling to do. So their, the vulnerability gives you a sense of the purpose or roundedness. And then in doing so, you also see a combination of where this guy can go. You can also imagine the journey he will take. So, but those uh, come once in a while, uh, X Factor founders. But along the way, we see those uh, being made up by a team of founders. I think that becomes part of the game. Mm. Yeah, Jonathan, you have a very interesting investment from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. How did that come about? Oh, yeah. Um, so it comes from a stroke of luck, I would say, um, and, and a bit of hustling. Um, I, I remember I had the luxury of being invited to Bill Gates for a, a very uh, close session lunch, um, 20 people. Um, and we were all told uh, to come to this lunch event in a very formal suit and, and whatnot. Um, at that time, I want to look stand out. Um, so I thought in my head, okay, I want to wear this Hello Doc shirt and actually wear my, uh, uh, and then try to show. But I know they will stop me. Um, so uh, not just the suit, but I actually put, um, what do you call it, a jumper to make sure that they, nobody can see this red shirt. So my friends were like asking me, How, um, John, are you sick? No, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. It was very hot. It was in Seattle, it was summer, but I was wearing all of this. So when he come in, I opened my jacket and I opened the, you know, the, the whole thing. So over the lunch, I basically asked a particular question um, or pitch about Hello Doc. Um, and then after, that, after, after my pitch, he was like saying, okay, uh, why don't you talk to my director? Um, and, Two years after that, they invest in us. Um, I don't know whether that stunt show actually create that uh, opportunity, but yeah, I think that was that's how we started. But it, it's not like coming after. It, it takes another two years for me to have conversation with the directors and, and, and so on. That's how, how we start. But I think that because of the alignment of mission, I think that makes life a lot easier for us to, to partner with them. Yeah. 
as a startup founder, you just gotta grab every opportunity that you have. <laughs> yeah, at this point in the um, panel discussion, we're gonna go into an audience poll. So you should see something uh, pop up on your screen. And the question is, are Indonesian startups better off focusing domestically or should they aim to go regional? So just take some time to answer the question. in. So we have an interesting um, answer to this. So 42% of respondents said that um, startups are better off focusing domestically, 20% said regional, and 38% said it depends. You know, John, what do you think of this? You know, we've seen some startups like Tokopedia and Bukalapak have a very, um, uh, you know, focused local strategy instead of, you know, going regional, uh, regional at first. Um, what, what are your thoughts on this? Look, I think, uh, you know, I, I like what Jonathan said, uh, you know, focus on the problem, uh, not on the solution. Uh, and so, look, I think if companies feel that the problem that uh, they've addressed uh, in their home market and the solution that they've come up with can travel across borders well, uh, then by all means, um, I think become regional, become global uh, as Google uh, and Microsoft, you know, companies like that have become. Uh, but then I think there are many companies who are focused on solving uh, one problem um, in one market and they do that extremely well. Um, and um, even that I think um, is, is fine um, and can be a, a great company. Um, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm less focused about whether a company should be um, regional or, or, or only maintain in one country in and of itself. Um, I think we should be focused more um, around, um, you know, what, what uh, the company can do uh, to solve problems. Now, obviously, I think over time, because you've seen a number of companies in Indonesia grow larger and larger, it would be great. Um, to see some of these companies also try to uh, tackle uh, the same problems regionally. And so we've seen a number of our companies do that tremendously well. Um, you know, uh, Ruanguru, for example, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, both Wilson and I are, are investors in, uh, they've done tremendously well in Indonesia, the leading sort of ed tech uh, company um, in Indonesia. And now we're seeing them also expand uh, to other markets in Southeast Asia. So I think that's, that's wonderful. Um, so um, I think uh, 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 di di uh, different um, uh, solutions for, for different companies. Do you think, um, you know, having a regional growth story is like a must-have if the company wants to go for an international IPO? I, I don't think it's a must-have. 
Although I do believe that in technology, scale matters. So if you take a look at company like C, for example, you know, today, uh, probably the largest you know, listed company, uh, South Asian company that's listed. I think one of the reasons why they've been able to expand um, so successfully is because with their scale, they're able to invest an immense amount of money into technology and research and development. And they can amortize that cost across, I don't know, 20 different markets. Um, the same with companies in, in China, Alibaba, Tencent, they're able to invest billions of dollars because they're addressing you know, one extremely large market. So I think this scale does bring, it, uh, bring uh, advantages. Um, and so you know, with technology, you know, uh, technology companies, um, obviously the technology and R&D plays a big part. And the investment required for that um, is substantial. And so, you know, when, you know, you're able to gain scale, whether by expanding across markets or expanding across products or rolling out more adjacency products, you know, that, that does uh, bring advantages. Uh, to John's comment. Mm. So if we look at the definition of entrepreneurship, it's about doing something from nothing to something, so from zero to one, right? Running a company is hard. So we have a very strong uh, opinion about this domestic, regionally, how, how you want to address the market. In our opinion, every entrepreneur must uh, operate in the environment that they are comfortable with. That's very important. And that translates that everyone should address their home market. Singapore entrepreneurs should start in Singapore, Vietnam, Vietnamese entrepreneurs have to start in Vietnam, Indonesian have to start in Indonesia. However, Indonesian entrepreneurs are lucky because they are sit on top of large population, huge country. Indonesia is the single largest homogeneous market in Southeast Asia. When you run a company in a homogeneous market, you can run and build a product really fast and you can scale. Now, when you scale, you can attract a lot of money. When you attract a lot of money, you can scale even more. So there's this flywheel and snowballing effect going on. Hence, starting in Indonesia actually gives you competitive advantage. Now, going out. We always advise our entrepreneur not to go out unless you win in your home country. Why? Because you have to protect your house. You have to protect your backyard. Don't let people come in first. Build entry barrier. Make sure that you are the winner in that category in your country and go abroad. So consistently, all our portfolio, like what John mentioned, Ruang Guru, they are number one in Indonesia. Now they go abroad. Sociola, we co-invest with John as well. They are number one in Indonesia. Now they go abroad. Traveloka, they are number one in Indonesia. Now they go abroad. Then you are defensible and you can expand and you scale, attract more money, scale again. It's a snowballing effect. Okay. Um, now we're going to go into another audience poll. So this is an interesting one. The question is, how interested are you in investing in the IPOs of Indonesian tech companies?
Okay, so the results are in. We have no one who said that they're against investing. 7% um, said that they're not interested. 21% said they're neutral. And, oh, sorry, can we have, yes. And 42% said they're interested. 30% said they're very interested. Um, you know, we did see this kind of investor interest in Bukalapak's IPO, which was um, Indonesia's largest ever IPO. Um, you know, as more Southeast Asian unicorns charge to the public market, what kind of fundamentals should investors look out for, the public investors? Um, Jeff, I know you've been um, looking at you know, the retail investor side for quite a while. What are your thoughts on this? I think so. this is actually the time of awakening for us as a whole. I think the, the, tech, the digital economy has yielded quite a lot of benefits in many ways for the lifestyles and also development economics for folks. I think now the test of it as the, economy, the business, new digital economy business models go to public markets, it allows the retail investors and the customers and the consumers of that service to also partake in this growth. Now the question has always been the definition of uh, public market stock. and then. The, you know, the, when we look at public market stock in different markets like Germany or in certain of the more Asian countries where savings is a big thinking, when people look at stocks, they look at blue chip stocks that are giving them dividend return. When you look at some of the more advanced markets where they see the public markets as an investment forward look, they are able to withstand the fact that some tech companies in the US don't pay dividends for 10-15 years. But here now back home in Southeast Asia, as the new normal of what is a public market stock. The redefinition of what investing comes in again. Uh, we see this as, a, for us, we see this as one part circular, the circular economy, the digital economy, where you go around, the investors from other regions come in, invest a company, grows enough size, solving all the problems to John's point, solving the problems the market has, and now it goes public and being able to share its wealth with the rest of the investors. On the other hand, the question begets, what's next for this stock? So going to the public market also brings many startups into the real mainstream world. You are now up against the boys. The pressures are not the VCs like uh, Wilson or myself. And now you have to go up and have against shareholders and uh, activist blocks and folks coming to your AGM and challenging you what are your plans. And if you can deliver the numbers, they will ask you to fire people or what you can do to bring your margins back. So those are the pressures that will come and I think that this is a great space for us because it actually closes the final loop of what the digital economy is about and uh, investing in Indonesia. Indonesia. Mm. Going back to um, the Bukalapa example, you know, since this is like a pioneer company, pioneer tech company in this thing, um, you know, we've seen the stock actually, you know, um, you know, decrease. The, their share price has decreased about, I think, it's sixteen percent from its first day close. Uh, you know, some investors are profiting from the initial share price rally. What are your thoughts about this? That's a good question. I think, uh, I think Facebook's price dropped 20% two weeks after the IPO. So those lucky, lucky folks who bought the price there today, those days, uh, benefited quite a lot. You know, being in a public market, it also tells you that uh, you are in a very there are a lot of dynamic forces around you, especially with a floating, a float of so such a big float that Bukala Park has. You have different types of investors with different appetites. So the, the challenge would be for the management of the company to continuously communicate with the market what their plans are, what they are doing and how they go forward. And it, I think they must have lots of experience after all these years pitching to VCs for the money and then building their red herring book to go IPO. And then now is to continuously reinforce the story, what problems you are trying to solve, what are new problems you are trying to solve and perhaps maybe uh, in the, while the, whilst the Indonesian market is homogeneous from a, from a helicopter perspective, as the consumption of the urban cities um, separate, uh, raised forward, the gap between the urban and the rural become big, much bigger. Perhaps uh, the, less, the Indonesian market becomes less homogeneous in a certain way. It allows some of the players, some of the startups to actually charge value-based pricing for the higher markets and a different product suite for the lower markets. So that could be the next story, the next rendition of the journey for Bogalapa. Mm -hmm, indeed. Jonathan, I'm turning my attention to you now. Um, how close is Halo Dog to an IPO? Mm. 
<laughs> That's an um, interesting question. I have to ask wisdom from Mr. Yadi here uh, and also from um, Wilson, I think, and also Jeff. Um, I think I think IPO would be um, every founder's dream, I would say. Um, I think the good thing, uh, I mean, we have we have built the company over five years. We've we've been through from stages of product market fit, where we educate the market, we give um, some freebies of, of the service, and we reach that critical point of um, the next level, which is um, y- you know that people have, uh, have actually been solved the problem. So we grow now into the next stage of profitable product market fit, and I think we have we have. Um, successfully uh, reach that particular um, solution as well. I think there are many aspects of, of going public, um, not, just, not just on the business itself. I think the way the structure and everything um, that I don't think we should underestimate uh, that fact. And to be honest, to answer, there are a lot of details that I have to ask uh, guidance from you know, very senior investors like John Riadi and, and all the panelists here on, on, on the time. But I don't think it should be, I will, I have to say it will not be in this year, um, but it would not be um, too far in the horizon, I would say. Um, mm. Yeah, so very precise in terms of time. I think I would just, there are too many of the unknown for me personally that I don't know enough to answer in particular time or deal, I would say. But I think the, the company itself is, is doing well. Uh, it reach um, many uh, possibilities in, in many aspects, I would say. Mm. Okay. John, I would like to take some early placements when you're ready. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Nice support going on here. Okay, so I have a final question. And um, for my final question, I want all of the panelists to chip in. So, you know, what are some mistakes that you've made when investing in or interacting in um, Indonesia's digital economy? And can you tell us more about the lessons that you've learned? Uh, Let's start with John. Well, uh, many mistakes uh, is, is the answer, Claudia. But, you know, um, one of the first, you know, in, in 2013, uh, when we were trying to figure out the technology space uh, in Indonesia and, and looking at making our first move, we uh, actually hired um, a company. Um, there was a, uh, an incredibly talented uh, uh, lady. Uh, uh, by the way, that lady now is working with Jeffrey uh, in his fund. Uh, but we had acquired her company um, to start at that time uh, what was uh, to be sort of an e-commerce company called Matahari Mall. And I, I think we had you know, good plans, good execution, a great team, a great leader in Yiping. Um, but one of the things we, I think, overlooked um, was the importance of um, uh, working within a larger ecosystem. So at that time, you know, that was sort of an e-commerce, you know, built for our department stores, our supermarkets. It was a very enclosed system. And, you know, as, as hard as they worked and, you know, we, we, we gave it everything we had, um, it, it wasn't successful. Um, and I think one of the takeaways there uh, was really sort of the importance of um, having a use case and working with an ecosystem. And it was that learning which we took and substantially the same team set up OVO, um, a digital payments company. Now, at that time, yes, you know, we fully leveraged, you know, our ecosystem. Our, you know, at, at, the, the biggest use case at the time was to pay for parking in our malls and our buildings. You know, you had to, there's free parking in our buildings. And that was really sort of the, the, the it, it really gave it the use case that, that, uh, uh, that made it sort of viral at that time. But very soon after we got the, uh, the use case working. Um, we also expanded the ecosystem at that time, entered into a partnership with Grab. And so, you know, when you opened the Grab app, the wallet within the Grab app was over. And then we did the same thing with Tokopedia. And so, you know, I think the, you know, one, one big takeaway is a, as big as your ecosystem is, in this digital world, it's never big enough. 
And so, again, the, the success of Over Today is because we did work with everyone else. And we brought in a number of you know, mega ecosystems and Grad and Tokopedia. Um, and, then, and, then, and, and it really took off. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the biggest lessons for us here um, is, is that. And so from, from then on, you know, obviously we you know, continue to invest in early stage startups and that's been extremely exciting. But on the other hand, what we've also done is not really to start our own companies per se, but how do we partner with digital companies and bring sort of the best of what we can offer and also the best of what other founders can offer um, and, and, and support that founder. Um, and, you know, over time we've seen that um, you know, that's been a, a, a great uh, sort of recipe um, and model for how we've done things. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, those are some of our, our lessons that, mm. that we've learned um, and some, some takeaways as we look forward. Wilson, what about you? Some of the mistakes that you've yeah. made, lessons learned. I think we should have invest more and run faster. I think we are too slow. We are too risk averse. Uh, the write-off percentage of our portfolio is about uh, 10 to 15 percent. I think global standard has to be 90 percent at seed level. So we have to do more probably to, yeah, five times than what we are doing now. Yeah. You're known for writing um, checks, you know, some checks quite quickly. You know, there are yeah. stories of how, you know, it's um, within two days, a few hours. And, but you think that you should still be faster? Yes, I think. Because... Uh, Seed investor is all about pattern recognition. So once you look at someone, you feel them, uh, you feel their integrity, sincerity, authentic, whether they differentiate themselves from others. Actually, your heart will tell you whether you want to invest or not. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think I, I should sharpen that part and make more bet, okay. bolder bet. <laughs> Jeffrey, how about you? You know, I, 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 I worked uh, in the corporate world with two big companies uh, owned by my Jewish bosses and listed in the, in the, in the, in the, in the American boards and the European boards. So in my DNA, I've been wired that everything must make money, right? It's all about profit. So one of the challenges, one of the early misses I had in not just Indonesia, but it's a lot of the Southeast Asian markets. When I looked at it, I, and I saw there was a lot of, uh, it was very logical to change what the digital economy could bring and what the problems we were solving. But I think in the haste for many of the companies uh, to win market share, I think the price flaws drop, all right? And a human by nature, uh, humans by nature are emotional. And I think uh, there's a lot of uh, regret, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of redemption as well. So often uh, when the final, when the startup wins the battle, they struggle to bring the, the pricing back. And then the, the price flaw just stays permanently. And so we have a market, we end up with uh, businesses that we invested in that have a great market share but struggle to make a decent profit and charge people value-based pricing. So there has been a theme that we have been careful to watch on because after all, humans are very emotional creatures, right? And, and I think that actually transcends a lot of the folks. So that has been a very clear part for us because I think we want, at the end of every investment, we want the company to do very well in a different, uh, whether it's a unicorn, a decacorn, and, I think Wilson was just sharing with me the size of those uh, Greek, uh, Greek creatures. But I think we want to also make it a real going concern in the private markets. Right. And that's for what sure. we aim for. Sustainability. Mm. Okay. Um, Jonathan, it's your turn now. Mistakes and lessons learned. I think one of my celebrated mistakes was um, about this one partnership that we had with one of this insurance company when we started um, I, me and the CEO we were we were so in love with this one solution we launched this one product together um, within Halodoc ecosystem um, the main theme here is we were falling in love with solution because I think it's very easy for us for everyone um, to, to fall in love with solution it's a very well celebrated uh, product. We did a press release, press conference, you know, marketing and, and, and things. And after, after a six months, what do you call it, um, tech built for this product, there's only two people using it. So um, I think the main take from this, and I always remember that event actually teach me a lot 
was don't fall in love with solution. Focus on what are the problems that you're trying to solve. So I was really um, falling in love with solution. Um, and, and that's why it's always, it's always been my theme, don't fall in love with solution, because that was just one example. Um, there are many other examples. And I think one of the uh, key takeaways there is you need to really um, understand your data. You need to uh, instrumentalize um, your, your this so then you can understand and read the, uh, uh, the real data to understand the real problem that you're trying to solve. Um, so I think, I think that's my key takeaway. And, and, and I think focusing on the right problem to solve, solve it and scale it, I think that's, that's, that's the, the biggest learning for me. Important to have that laser focus. Okay, so right now we're going to move into the Q&A section. Uh, we have some questions from the audience. So our first question here is, what competitive advantages would a company perceived to be a local champion, uh, such as Gojek, have over a company perceived to be foreign, such as Grab? Uh, you know, any, any of the panelists can take this question. What's your question? This is a very sensitive mm. question, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, what's the question behind that question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's nothing at, at their level. Right. It's nothing to do whether they are, uh, they are a foreign company okay. or a local company. Okay. It is clear that they, both of them executed very well yeah. and bring a value to community, right? So it's all about... Uh, how they evolve and scale bigger, solve more problems, and bring more impact to society. Mm -hmm. I think at their level, it's all about that. Yeah. It's no longer about the question of uh, local or foreign. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this talk about the Indonesia pride and, you know, um, being local. I mean, Indonesian pride is one thing, but you want to be pride of a good product. Mm -hmm. you, you're proud of good product. So, I think the key it's about the quality of the product. Okay. And if it's built by Indonesian, we are happy. If it's built by Singapore, we are happy. If it's built by Vietnamese, we are happy. Mm. I think, yeah. Mm. It's all about the quality of the product. Mm. Okay. Um, our second question is, digital banks are experiencing great growth, even though uh, without sufficient assets. What are your thoughts regarding this situation and how can the digital banks become sustainable in the long run? I can okay. answer a quick one. <laughs> yeah, great. In my opinion, digital bank has to be doing bank activities without bank, as transparent as possible. Mm. And today, bank is broken because if you want to do a simple transaction, if let's, even though they have internet uh, banking services, and you start queuing in the counter, it takes like forever. Yeah. So if there is a way to do all the banking activities without even feel that it's like doing some uh, banking activity, I think that's the ultimate goal of digital bank. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought that the banking has always been a, a very uh, a very established institution in a way of life, in a way of uh, societies. I think in disrupting it, uh, I think the first part about it is not just expecting the same bank, expecting a different way of results, but with the, the bank organization still there. So sometimes I think the regulatory bodies and the uh, need to also have a lesser hand in regulating it, whilst the protection for the final consumer is still there, but the, the hand shouldn't be so heavy in allowing to develop. Uh, that said, we have stories about Wirecard and some of the other uh, happenings, but I think it is for, it's not for lack of trying, but I think the Wirecard guys actually do bring the value to the marketplace. And I think the, the banking world, uh, being an institution, the, expect the expectation of it changing is much more greater than for a new industry like right hailing. So there it goes, again it goes back to the consumer behaviour and what they expect of it. Mm. And I, th I think the success of whether digital banks will work will depend on a, um, a lot more factors compared to a new institution like right hailing. Yeah, we're seeing this trend of um, digital banks being quite popular among the tech savvy millennials. Um, and, you know, the digital banks also try to get these users to stay in the ecosystem through things like gamification. Um, but, you know, what would it take for 
these users to actually stay within the ecosystem and be loyal customers. You know, we see that in traditional banking, but is it going to pan out in digital banking? I mean, I take a first punt in it. I, I thought that uh, the new banks have done one thing which uh, old folks like me uh, never got. Uh, in my time, uh, I need to make sure I have a certain level of wealth before I become a, have a private banking uh, consultant coming to me. Today, if you download an app, the app is like a private banking consultant mm. for a youngster. You come on, you put money, you can transfer, you can buy things, you can remit, you can buy, you can pay for your NFTs, you can do everything else. And then uh, the more I add to the basket of services, the more I feel that I'm very well taken care of. I have a personal concierge and you give me many robot advisory for many things. So I think that space, um, the joy of being a private banking customer, you, you get your own set. I think that's the magic of digital banks and why they are appealing to the millennials. Okay. Um, our next question is, in the post-pandemic economy, will offline or brick or mortar thrive? Um, John, I think you had quite an interesting perspective on this and you mentioned briefly just now about the marriage of offline and online. Yeah, so, you know, interestingly, if you look at a place like China, and that is oftentimes sort of a, 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 oftentimes a sort of a, it gives us a sense of where things may go in a place like Indonesia. You'll see that from the total retail market, um, online makes up about 30% of that total retail market in China. Brick and mortar, what they call modern retail, is still around 50%. And the remainder of approximately 20% is traditional retail. So it's, it's about a 30, 50, 20 breakdown. Now, in a market like Indonesia today, that same breakdown is approximately 10% online, 30% modern or brick and mortar, and the remainder 60% traditional. So if you believe that the model for Indonesia will converge to the industry structure as you see in China, obviously, online will be the fastest growing. It's going to grow from 10% of the pie to 30% of the pie of a much larger and larger pie over the next five to 10 years. But interestingly, even brick and mortar will go from 30% today to approximately 50% if you believe you know, in the China model. Obviously, the traditional market for various reasons will shrink. But as a result, I think you, you know, what, however you slice the numbers, I think the takeaway is that offline retail or brick and mortar retail will continue to exist. So I don't think today, I think if you read the literature and, and, and the commentary, it's not online versus offline. I don't think we envision a world where online will be 90% of total retail, we'll be living in our own you know, sort of virtual realities. That's maybe further down the road. But for the foreseeable future, it's about how do you bring online and offline together? And that's why people use the term omni-channel. It's not on, online per se, it's omni-channel, which is how do you combine the experiences of online and the experiences of offline and create a unified, converged, um, superior uh, experience for the consumer. So again, that, that doesn't mean all offline businesses will succeed. All right. Uh, it means the total retail pie for offline will continue to grow. But obviously, for us offline players, we continue to need to transform. All right. But that also doesn't mean that we're going to disappear. And so, you know, I believe that, you know, for offline players like us, the network that you have, nationwide logistics, you know, 150 stores across 76 cities, you know, things like that are extremely difficult to replicate in a market like Indonesia, where there's 70,000 islands, et cetera, et cetera, all the challenges of infrastructure. So it's very valuable. The question is, how do we unlock this? How do we work with digital players to, um, to transform the experience and to be able to deliver to the consumer um, online when they want it online in their home or offline when they want to come to a mall? Um, so it's about, I think, ultimately, how do we be focused on the customer um, and, and, and deliver for that customer a unified, converged, a truly omnichannel experience. Right. So our next audience question is somewhat related to um, you know, what you talked about. Because COVID has definitely accelerated the pace of digitalization, right? Um, but at the same time, it's also accentuated the social inequality that we're seeing um, right now. What can private sector players do to actually improve the situation Look, 
Claudia, this is a, is a, I'm, I'm, I thought this was a, not a political panel, but it's a great question. Uh, I think uh, by my nature, the, the digital economy actually uh, naturally orientates a society towards the haves and have-nots. The digital economy actually allows, provides people a lot of access, a lot of choice to many, uh, to many services that we see today. Some of them are subsist subsistence-based. So people want to be quick, they get it, and now they have access to it. To the rest who are more well-endowed, it allows them to see the world and have a bit more conspicuous consumption. So in that part, as a digital economy brings, uh, I think to the earlier point, right, the dividend it brings, right, sometimes may just make a society less homogeneous because it gets those who have it will get more and then more services will be catered to them and those who are lesser will just go for what they require. I think in that space itself, the, the orange, some often mention as you read some of the books written by the, uh, some of the papers written by the American universities on the digital economy, it says that this digital economy brings uh, accelerated development economic uh, principles to the country. It actually draws out the middle class faster and then builds and then establishes uh, fault lines between the different classes. I think there and there, I think uh, you will see that coming through as more and more societies go into this space. Definitely something that we should keep an eye on. Yeah. I'm sorry I'm not answering your question directly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so just final two questions. And, you know, this is for the investors here. What's the most critical aspect that VC considers before investing in an early stage startup with negative cash flow? Founding team. Mm -hmm. People, people, and people. As simple as that. The reason is sim very simple. So you have... Uh, a team, you have the problem to solve, and then you have the market. A uh, great team will, will build a good product. So the, the, the pivotal point will be the, the team, that they can keep building different products to navigate and to address different markets. So it is very important that you focus on the team and whatever product that they build, addressing a big market. Because if you find and invest in a great team, and they're targeting small market, they're wasting time. They're wasting their time, they're wasting our time as an investor. Because small market have ceiling. And once they hit the ceiling and they want to navigate to another market, it will take a while. So it is very important, first team and team and team, and second one, huge market. Product doesn't matter. <laughs> no, no, I, I take it to the extreme actually. Yeah. I take it to the extreme that when a new guy, new founders pitch to us, I don't let them run through the deck because the deck doesn't really matter. Okay. The, 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 the deck is the cheat seat for them to follow the right. storyline. Right, yeah. right. But rather, I want them to be, be truthful, sincere, tell about their story, why, what kind of problem they solve, and I assess the market, whether it's big enough, and this is the right team to address the market. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, and our final question, this is quite an interesting one. Um, how can we, as teenagers, participate in investing in Indonesia's digital economy. <laughs> Jonathan, do you want to take this one, founder's perspective? How teenagers investing or um, being part of the ecosystem? Creating in investing, so could come in many forms. Um, yeah, I don't know whether I'm the right person to answer this, but I would say, I think, I think, um, I think to Jeff's point, right, these days the world is, is, is very different than many years ago. Uh, many, um, like now you can basically invest everywhere, whether it's, you know, um, uh, companies like from Kickstarter to, to, um, to um, maybe, maybe there's a new platform coming soon that is also focusing on, on startups. Um, or or in, or in a digital company that just went public like Bukalapak, or um, a few companies that I'm sure John and 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 Wilson have in their portfolio. I think being part uh, and understand this up early would be would be would be very interesting. But I think there is a, a rise of the new digital economy that I think we cannot underestimate. I mean, the rise of the NFTs, the rise of the cryptocurrencies. That I think the the teenagers of today's world would 
be a lot easier to adapt and understand. Maybe even um, some of the senior investors um, still learning also. Um, I personally still learning and I am openly say that I don't know enough about this new uh, world of, of uh, NFTs. And I mean, I'm still, uh, and I think if you use the word teenagers, I think they should um, understand and see that opportunity because I think that's, that's definitely rising um, faster than, than ever, I think. Teenager daughter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think uh, you must open up your mind. Uh, don't look at the world like what you look at in front of you. There, there is something bigger than that. And the best way to experience, especially the country like emerging country like Indonesia, is to have a immersive experience. If there is a student exchange program, just go for it. If there is an internship program, just go for it. Because there are many things that you can't read or you can't feel or you, you, you can't watch it on, on the YouTube or video or whatever. You have to feel it on the ground. It, it will enhance your intuition. It will enhance your common sense, actually, because there are certain things that Singapore is a very developed uh, country, right? Everything here is a best case scenario. Mm -hmm. Indonesia is an emerging country and some of other uh, countries in uh, Southeast Asia, of course. Those are many times worst case scenario. So when you have this best case scenario and you have experience in worst case scenario, you have a contrast. When you have a contrast, you know the gap. When you know the gap, you find opportunity. That's what I think. I think we got a, we got a new startup coming up, uh, how to let teenagers invest in a digital economy. Perhaps that's a problem statement for a startup to come about. I, I do think that the, the word investment today comes in many different forms, right? I think the capital markets, the private markets, uh, the public markets, they can do that with their parents' accounts or they can do ETFs. I think they can all do that. But I think there are so many surrogates out there, ways of investing in the Indonesian economy. And I think that those are out there and available to everyone. Uh, per se, I would then, then, harbor the, then put a thought towards the person asking the question. I think uh, they should take the advice from Wilson and go around to the market and experience it. And just like when very often in, uh, since the uh, push of Singapore, I mean coming from Singapore, I was, when I was very young, I was very impressed by what uh, the founding prime minister kept telling us. First day you leave school with your army experience, go across the world. And then many of us take that route and uh, work 20 years all over the world. And I think that brings a lot of perspective. I must say that uh, I have uh, spent a bit more time in South America, had a choice, but I think uh, that will have been a big difference to the way I look at emerging markets. But the Indonesia is just at the back, it's just a neighbour to us. And my f Indonesian friends were in Singapore and then they, they fly here and there just like taking an MRT train, right? And I was, right? But I, I do think that it is a market which uh, actually for every youngster around this region should go there and work a year or two. Then you experience really what is a country that is 16,000 islands and how it works. Get out and do things. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's perfect timing. Um, you know, I would like to thank all our panelists for joining us today for all of your wonderful insights. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, and thank you to you at home or in the office for tuning in. And, you know, please remember to uh, fill up the Zoom survey as you exit the session. Once again, thank you so much on behalf of the Business Times and Garage, and have a good day ahead. <laughs>